Right, okay, so we have four times over here, six times over here, seven times, eight times, 10 times, 15 times, 20 times over there, a 9 to 27 over there, and a 30 to 60 time zoom over here. In this video, we're going to be taking a look through a whole host of binoculars, scopes, and monoculars, just to see how the different magnifications affect the view. And we're going to start right now. So before we get started, I just wanted to quickly take you behind the scenes to show you some of the equipment and the setup that I used. I have a bunch of digibinning and digiscoping adapters in my collection, many of which I have reviewed, links down below. But most of these are for smartphones, and as I was also using a very wide range of optical devices, all with different shapes and sizes of bodies and eyepieces, it was not possible to, for me to find a single adapter that would accommodate all of them, as well as the lens of my APS-C camera. And so, to make this comparison test as equal as possible, I came up with this somewhat elaborate, but I do believe effective setup. For the smaller, as well as standard size binoculars, I fixed my camera right at the rear of the mounting plate on my Movo gimbal tripod head. Attach this on top of my Vanguard tripod, and I would simply then slide the binoculars in between the cradle offering up one of the eyepieces to the camera lens. Then, for the large binoculars, as well as the spotting scopes, I mounted these onto a second tripod, my Bressa BX5 Pro, which has a super adjustable head on it, which, in combination with the gimbal head on the Vanguard tripod, allowed me to position the eyepieces in the perfect position to film through. Is this setup practical for anything other than use from a static position? No, not at all. But once I had it set up, I found it worked really well, allowing me to swap between the different binoculars, monoculars and scopes fairly easily, and I do feel it enabled me to keep the playing field as level as possible. To begin with, I positioned my setup about 5 meters away from a bird feeder, located in a tree just outside some sliding doors we have downstairs, which as long as I am quiet does not deter the birds from visiting. The view you see is taken from this position using my Fujifilm X-T200 camera with a 25mm lens attached. It is my understanding that for an APS-C sensor camera like this, the equivalent range that gives a similar field of view as that of a human eye is between 28 to 34mm. This I would agree with, but to approximate what the normal or naught time zoom looks like through my eyes, I've had to zoom into the image a little here, which reduces the field of view compared to normal eyesight. Right, so on to the zoom comparisons. First on the list is the lowest powered binoculars that I have, the tiny Pentax VD 4x20. And whilst I call it a binocular, it can actually split into two and thus transforms into a pair of 4x monoculars. And then on top of that, you can actually join these two monoculars end on end to produce a very small 16x telescope. But more on that later. What is interesting to me here is, because of the low 4x magnification, you get a wide field of view compared to most other binoculars, and thus you can still see the inside of the house. I would also like to note that because they went first, I was still experimenting somewhat, and getting used to the setup. As well as this, the sun was still quite low in the sky and in front of us. So whilst there is, yes, some curvature in the view when you look through the binoculars, I would say that what I captured really does not do this super little instrument any justice at all. And I would just like to say that whilst I really like it, I don't think I would recommend it for digiscoping. Next up, we move to a 6x zoom, which is still considered very low in the sporting optics world. And to demonstrate, I have another really tiny instrument from Pentax, the Pentax VM 6x21 monocular. I found this much easier to work with and achieve a sharp image than the 4x monocular which is largely down to the way you adjust the focus using a unique rocker system. Apart from usually having a much wider field of view, a big advantage of a less powerful magnification like this is you don't need large lenses in order to produce a reasonably large exapupil. I go over the exapupil in detail on the BBR website, link down below. But most importantly, a large exapupil plays an important part in ensuring you see a brighter image. 
especially in low light conditions. And I have to say, it really, really helps when digiscoping. So even though this six times monocular only has a very small 21 millimeter lens, you can see I was able to capture a really bright, crisp image with it. Also, at closer ranges like this, the relatively wide field of view made it much, much easier for me to lock onto my target, in this case the bird feeder, than the more powerful instruments I use later on. Due to them generally having a wide field of view and relatively large exit pupils, that is in relation to their objective lens sizes, both of which are important in sort of foresty type of environments, a 7x zoom on a binocular was traditionally the preferred magnification for users like birders. However, times have changed, and whilst it is still the most common option for a marine binocular, this is largely due to the added image stability you get with lower magnifications. It is currently quite difficult to find a standard 7x binocular designed specifically with terra firma uses as the main focus. So to demonstrate the 7x zoom level, I have with me the Hawk Endurance ED 7x50 marine binoculars. And yes, whilst they are labelled as marine binoculars, they have a number of non-typical marine features that I go through in detail in their review. But it means they work equally well for many land-based uses as well. The 7x50 configuration produces a very large exapupil of more than 7mm. This helps a lot in low light condition. This large exapupil also meant that I found this binocular to be noticeably easier for me to line it up with the camera and get a good image. When using a binocular in the normal way, that is to say with your eyes and not a camera, this also holds true, as binoculars with large exapupils make lining them up correctly with your eyes to achieve a full field of view much easier to achieve. And whilst you can't see it because I'm using a tripod to get these images, it is also easier to get a shake-free view. And it is for these two reasons, and, and indeed more, that I always suggest lower powered binoculars for newbies, older people, and especially kids. Having said that, don't think that a low magnification is not also for more advanced users. With their good low light capabilities and wide, shake free views, I happily and often do choose a 7x zoom binocular for my general day to day use, most of my forest and backyard birding, as well as wildlife observation. I just wish they had not gone out of fashion and that there were more of them readily available on the market. Binoculars with an 8x magnification are now the most common choice for the general forest type of birder and wildlife observer, as it provides a little more reach or image detail than you would get on a 7x zoom and you usually don't have to compromise much in terms of the field of view, low light capabilities and the amount of image shake. In fact, as is aptly demonstrated by the fantastic footage I captured here using the Swarovski NL Pure 8x32 binoculars that only have a 4mm exapupil, if you opt for the highest level of optical quality, you can actually achieve a better, brighter view than lesser binoculars with a much larger exapupil. However, do keep in mind that you will have to spend a lot more money to achieve this. So other than for interest sake, it is not really fair to compare the image quality of a $300 instrument against one like this that costs almost $3,000. In future articles and videos, I do plan to compare image quality between binoculars of the same configuration but at different price points, and then also binoculars with the same magnification but different sized objective lenses, and thus different sized exit pupils. But for now, I am trying, and I'd also like you to try, to keep the main focus of your attention on the different zoom levels and just how they compare against each other. To demonstrate the 10 times zoom, I've used footage captured with two different 10x42 binoculars, the GPO Passion HD 10x42 and the Hawk Frontier APO 10x42 that I currently have in for testing for a view that will soon be up on PBR. So along with 8x, 10 times is also another very popular magnification or zoom level found on binoculars and is certainly one that I would still consider a good general use magnification suitable for most mainstream outdoor uses. Whilst I've heard many people say that there is not much difference between an 8x and a 10x binocular, I think it is quite clear to see from these images 
that you do get quite a lot closer to your subject with a 10 times zoom when compared to the eight times we saw previously. Having said that, at longer ranges, this two times zoom difference is not as obvious as it is at close range like this. This is certainly something to keep in mind when selecting which magnification you should get on your next set of binoculars. With a bigger zoom, you potentially get more image detail, but then holding the instrument from your hands, any shaking is magnified just that little bit more, and thus it can get to the point where you can't appreciate that extra image detail a higher power delivers. At 10 times, this is still usually not an issue for most users, but as we go up in power, this problem gets more and more pronounced until you really do need something like a tripod. Also, do take note of the different fields of view between 8 times and 10 times. The higher the power, or the more you zoom in, the narrower the view. At close ranges, a narrower view can make it especially difficult for you to find and then follow your subject. So next up, I wanted to demonstrate to you the much more powerful 15 and 20 time zooms using binoculars. With me, I have the Celestron Skymaster Pro 15 by 70, the Bressa Special Astro 15 by 70, and the Celestron Echelon 20 by 70 binoculars. However, all three are designed for long range observation and in particular astronomy. So none of them are able to focus at such short range. Please note, I will be making more videos in this series, and I have already actually shot quite a lot of the footage for them. In them, I will be concentrating more on medium and long ranges, where these instruments will certainly be featured. But for the high power zoom comparison tests at close range, we will now have to swap over to spotting scopes, oh, and yes, also one tiny little telescope. Right, so you remember that tiny 4x Pentax VD binocular we began with? that could split into two and then be joined end on end to make a 16x telescope? Well, that can actually focus to a very close range, and this is what I managed to capture with it. Apart from the zoom level difference, it is interesting to note how much dimmer the image is when compared to the footage I captured with it as a 4 times monocular. This is because it still has a 20mm lens, but a far higher 16x magnification which produces a tiny 1.25mm exapupil. Whereas, as a binocular or a monocular, it created a much larger 5mm exapupil. So whilst yes it is true, by putting the two monoculars end on end, the light now has to travel or pass through much more glass to get through to your eyes, which is sure to make a difference in image brightness. But I think it also demonstrates just how important the exapupil size can be for image brightness. Also worth mentioning here is because we are zoomed in so much, a lot of the action is happening outside of our field of view. With my setup, quickly moving the view is not an option. So had I been using a lower powered device, I am sure we would have captured these two sibling squabbling. So next up is an example of the zoom range and the type of image you can expect at close range from a small travel friendly type of spotting scope. I am using the popular Celestron Hummingbird ED 56mm spotting scope that has a 9 to 27 times zoom eyepiece. For a spotting scope, it has a relatively small 56mm lens, but for a binocular this would be considered large. So comparing it to the tiny 20mm lens on the 16 times Pentax monocular we looked at previously, even at 27 times magnification the spotting scope is able to produce a much brighter image. As I zoom in and out, just take note of how the field of view changes, but also how the image brightness also changes. Whilst I really like this particular scope for normal use, that is with my eyes, the design of its focus ring that goes all the way around the body makes it much harder for me to use when digiscoping compared to the larger and much more powerful bresoscope, which I will demonstrate next.
Right, so last, but by no means least, is the sort of image and zoom level you can expect to see when looking at something at close range through a full-size spotting scope with a powerful magnification. To demonstrate, I'm using my Bresser Perch Gen 2 80mm scope that has a very wide range, 20 to 60 times zoom eyepiece fitted. Because of its high quality optics and the large 80mm lens that lets in plenty of light, the image brightness is impressive, especially at 20 times zoom level, where it easily matches many binoculars with less than half the amount of power. So just remember, a 10x42 binocular, for example, will have a 4.2mm exit pupil, whilst at 20 times zoom, with its 80mm lens, this is comparable as it produces a 4mm exit pupil, but you get two times the image detail. The downside to this is you have a much larger instrument that has to be mounted on a tripod to use. And of course, you will also notice the massively reduced field of view. Also worth pointing out here is that as well as a reduced field of view, the more you zoom in, the shallower your depth of view becomes, meaning you have to be far more accurate with the focusing. This is fine for a static object, but one that is moving means you have to constantly change the focus. Indeed, at such close range, zooming up beyond 20 to 30 times was really not necessary, and it made it very difficult for me to try and keep even a fairly static bird on a feeder in the frame and in focus. As I zoom in to full 60 times magnification, notice how the image gets dimmer and dimmer. This is once again caused by the exit pupil reducing in size. So at full 60 times zoom, the exit pupil on an 80 mm scope is only 1.3 millimeters in diameter, which is similar to the 16 times 20 Pentax telescope we saw earlier. Like the large binoculars, a powerful scope like this really comes into its own at mid to long ranges, which is something I will be covering in the next episode in this series. So I know I said the Bresser spotting scope would be the last instrument we look at for this zoom comparison test. But during the making of this video, a package arrived for me from Canon, who I know wanted me to test and review their tiny digital zoom monocular. On first inspection, it looks like a simple little device with two optical zoom levels, 100mm and 400mm. And then on top of that, you also have a digital 800mm zoom, which, according to my research on the internet, loosely translates to a zoom of two times eight times and then up to 16 times. But I think this may be referring to a camera with a larger sensor because on the Canon website, they say it has zoom levels of 1.2 times, 4.8 times and 9.6 times. So because there's a discrepancy, I thought it would be interesting to also capture some footage with it from the same position, which is what you're looking at now. And then we could compare it to the optical devices to see if we could work out what zoom level it actually is. Let me know what you think in the comment section below, but to me it kind of looks like the middle 400mm setting is about the same zoom level as a 10x binocular. The default 100mm view to me looks slightly less zoomed in than the 4x binoculars we looked at earlier, so maybe it has a magnification of around 2 to 3 times. Whilst the 800mm digital zoom looks to me to be a little more powerful than the 16x Pentax telescope, and just below that of the 20 times magnification on the Bresser spotting scope. So I guess somewhere between 16 and 20 times magnification. Also, an interesting point to note here is I captured all this footage from my hands without using a tripod to keep the image still. While certainly not at the same level as Canon's well-known IS or image stabilized binoculars, I do feel the image stabilization on what is essentially an entry level device is still pretty impressive. I also noticed that the image you see on the LCD screen when looking through the Canon monocular, to my eyes, looks better and brighter than the footage it actually records. This is why, I think based on my first look at it, I would think of this device not as a camera, but more as a compact monocular with a pretty powerful zoom that can also record if you want to. Anyway, I'm not going to go into any more detail on this interesting device in this video, as I still need to do a whole bunch more research and testing. The full review will be up on BBR pretty soon, so do look out for that. 
Right, okay, so there you go. I do hope that this uh, magnification uh, comparison test was of, of interest to you and perhaps even useful, who knows. Um, if it was, please do remember to give us a thumbs up and if you would like to, please remember to subscribe to the channel. Then before you go, um, I'd just like to mention quickly that the reviews to all these binoculars bar the uh, Swarovski NL Pures and the uh, Canon Digital uh, Monocular um, are on the BBR website. The links are down below. The reviews to these will be up shortly, so if you're watching this in a couple of weeks' time, those links will be down below as well. Don't know why I said all that. Anyway, then also move, I'm saying uh, I would like to just add to that, moving forward, I'm going to be adding, or well, I'm going to try and add uh, footage shot through the binoculars um, to all my reviews and other videos and things like that. Um, this is something that's been asked to, um, for me to do time and time again and up till now I've been fairly reluctant to do so. Um, it's mainly because uh, I've always found that it's really really hard to maintain uh, and be consistent. Um, you know it's it's quite fine to shoot all on the same day with the same camera. You know there you can keep the lighting conditions um, fairly consistent um, and you're using the same equipment um, with exactly the same settings. So whereas if I if I write a review, say I wrote a review two years ago, the, you know the quality of the camera and the lens that I was using is vastly different to the one I'm using today, and you know going forward that will change as well. And on top of that, you know just maintaining the consistency with the weather and the lighting conditions is a whole other story. So as I said, up until now I've been really reluctant to do so, but. Um, I've got a little bit better with my settings on the camera, um, I've improved on that and then on top of that um, I had an idea that I would like to set up something like a test pattern, you know, perhaps here in the, the studio and thereby I would be able to be more consistent, well I would have consistent lighting and obviously the distance to the, the target would always remain the same. So that could be interesting and you know and if anyone out there is an expert in this field or has advice for me I would really, really appreciate it. So please use that comment section down below or feel free to get um, you know contact me through the website because um, I'd really like to um, hear from you because this is something that I'm you know I've been wanting to do and I'm pretty excited to to do because I, I do feel it'll add another dimension to the reviews in that um, you won't just be relying on you know my thoughts um, and comments on, on, on the particular view um, uh, when I've gone out and reviewed a binocular. Phew, that was a bit of a mouthful to get out. Um, I don't think I messed up too badly anyway along the way. So before I do, I'm gonna leave it there for now and say thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon. Cheers for now.